Hi, everybody. It's a real honor to be here today. I am a sociologist, I'm a medical sociologist, um, and I've been studying and work uh, with, been studying women's health issues uh, for over 20 years. I always begin my classes at Rutgers by explaining that disease is never just biological, it's also social, political, and economic, and always deeply political. So this year, I think I'm just going to have the pandemic teach my class for me. The pandemic has revealed these deep structural issues in our healthcare system uh, and profound inequities in how healthcare is allocated and how uh, much risk we have in getting sick. But in doing so, I really hope that this has also given us an opportunity to build a just, a more just healthcare system and build better healthcare system. So the points that I want to uh, address today are that women's diseases are stigmatized, that we don't know enough about diseases that disproportionately affect women, and that we don't have sufficient policies in place to support women who are disabled by these diseases. Um, I think before I, I really get into these uh, points, I just want to point out something um, I, I think important about these two diseases we're talking about, migraine and ME-CFS. Um, they share in common this, this notion that a, a lot of people just think that they're not that big of a deal. Uh, people think that migraine is just a bad headache. People think that ME-CFS is just fatigue. Uh, but they're really both complex, serious, very disabling diseases. Migraine is a neurological disease. It, it affects the whole body. It makes you uh, tired. It gives you cognitive dysfunction. It's not just the pain in the head. Um, and it's also remarkably common. Uh, 40 million people have migraine, not just women, although women are uh, three quarters of the people who have migraine. Um, so most of you probably either have migraine or know somebody who has migraine. Um, and although some people just have a migraine attack now and again, there are people who have chronic migraine and who are severely disabled. Uh, similar to migraine, people think that ME-CFS is just fatigue, but it's really a devastating multi-system disease that causes energy depletion at a cellular level. People who have ME-CFS are very likely to be disabled. If you look at how NIH allocates funding, as measured by disability adjusted life years um, or dailies, what you would see is that migraine and ME-CFS uh, are not allocated sufficient funding uh, relative to the amount of burden uh, that they cause. So that uh, they should be allocated something upwards of perhaps 100 to 200 million dollars per year. Research is uh, for migraine. Um, Every year, migraine gets about $20 million in research, uh, and um, MECFS uh, receives about $5 million. First of all, one thing that we haven't mentioned is that the stigma around these diseases that's gendered affects men as well, right? So when men with migraine go for treatment, they are thought that the, the whole delegitimation delegitimation of these diseases means that when men go get help, they're also thought to have unimportant diseases. So it's not just about women getting care. It's that the, the, the feminization of these diseases means that nobody's getting care. Uh, so that's part of this. The other part is that there's not enough medical education. University hospitals depend on NIH funding. They're not going to hire specialists in areas where they're not getting funding, it lowers the status of these areas of specialty. Uh, and so this has knocked off effects. People are also research, you know, medical students aren't interested in areas that don't seem interesting because there's nothing going on in there. So there, there are these all these knockdown effects. Thank you so very much. I appreciate uh, the invitation to be here. I'm happy to be a part of all this. Uh, I don't have any slides. I was going to talk a little off the cut, cuff because I'm a bit of a historian for the MECFS uh, clinical and research community. I started in this field in the 80s, at the same time we were coping with an um, HIV epidemic. The funding has been very poor and uh, our average funding, this is shocking, has been in the three to six million dollar range for the entire country for an illness that affects a million people and throws them on their knees in the height of their, their productive years. Uh, it's been a very distressing thing to discover that 
Um, there's more, I, I looked it all up. There's more funding for male pattern baldness. There is for ME-CFS coming out of the NIH. And that is a sad state of affairs. COVID presents an interesting opportunity. As many people have heard this so-called long haulers uh, illness of people who aren't recovering from COVID is shockingly disproportionately affecting women over men. A <laughs> big surprise, a chronic inflammatory condition. And it's so new that we can't say yet, is this ME-CFS? Sounds like it. If you read the symptoms list, or you read some of the early work on the biomarkers, but, um, but is it? We don't know. The work has to be done. If ever there was a time to intervene on an illness to try to prevent it from becoming a lifelong horrible illness, it's in the first months of the illness. Right now, in the post-COVID group, we should be doing things, helping them, helping them learn how to take care of themselves, but also putting into play some kick-ass good clinical trials that could really help people, but also teach us what we need to know for the ME-CFS population that became ill before COVID. There's this whole concept in um, research about brain diseases that involve chronic inflammation is this multiple hit thing. And it also applies to migraines. The, um, did you have a toxic injury? Did you have a traumatic injury, like a you know, automobile accident or traumatic brain injury, even very mild? Do you have repeated injuries? And then all the things that um, really make that worse, if you don't have an anti-inflammatory biologic response at that time that's rapid and quick and, and good, um, you're going to be more likely to fall into a chronic disease state. So women are biologically more prone because we have less natural anti-inflammatory. We have um, no um, testosterone to speak of, which is very anti-inflammatory, and other um, hormones that are normally made that uh, can be protective. And so there's a reason why women are more vulnerable, and it's a focus of a lot of research to try to better understand that vulnerability. But let it be said, women are more vulnerable to having chronic disease happen from an acute injury. I honestly think this is an opportunity to see significant increased funding in our field. We're not going to be leaving MECFS in the dust. We're going to be, as we have been for years, getting our funding any which way we can, smoke and mirrors. And if that means we're doing post-COVID MECFS compared to pre-COVID MECFS studies for the coming years, you're going to be the comparator group. Well, that's cool. We'll learn all the science we need to learn from that. I'm going to say time and time again, we urgently need clinical intervention, trials, monies, and an easy flow of that money, an easy way to access it um, to flow into this field. It is time to do the trials. And for these post-COVID folks, uh, no time like the present. What you heard a lot of people talking about in this um, discussion is the importance of using telehealth as a tool to be able to continue your care and perhaps even access care you couldn't have before. And so um, I'm excited, actually, that one fallout of the COVID era is that we are able to use telehealth in all of its best possible ways. I'm going to still say, if nothing beats a physical exam, and I would love to have you in my office, but failing that, I'll trust another doctor's physical exam, but I can help take care of you if I have enough information, have the capacity to do it. With these little centers of excellence that are all around the country, um, that's very helpful to you, but they are so overutilized. Our wait list is hundreds long before the COVID epidemic. How sad is that? It means that we haven't learned how to translate medical education to the field uh, uh, well enough that you can receive the care you need on site. That you're flying all the going to Baltimore for your injections for migraines? That's nuts. They're right around the corner. What's that about? So. So we should be able to, there's a lot of doctors in our country. We need to give them the treatment algorithms they need to be able to treat you effectively and not make you be your advocate, dragging her all the way around the country trying to find every expert on the planet to help you. I'm grateful to um, reporters and the um, folks that are writing about the long haulers in the respect they are playing to the MECFS community. They're not coming from this, oh, there was this bogus illness, but now there's real illness. There was a real risk for that. 
You know, mm-hmm. this has been considered a bogus illness. It's not. These people are sick as hell, as you have heard today. And they've given up so much and they just don't feel like people are listening or responding. And they're right. They're absolutely right. If you looked at the centers of excellence across this country right now, there are no more than there were 20 years ago. And they're the same people and they're old enough to retire. That should kind of chill you a little bit. There's not very many young investigators, young doctors coming into this field. It is time to wide open those doors and pressure. There was a time when aging was considered a not okay thing to do. And then NIH created a center of aging. They recreated all kinds of career tracks in aging. They made a lot of money happen for aging. And now it's like a kick-ass good area to be in academically, right? And we've learned so, so much. We could do the same for this around women, around racial inequity, but also around this, these particular diseases as, as sort of the, the banner mm-hmm. illnesses to show how badly it's been done. Thank you so much, everyone, for um, allowing us to present today to the Bipartisan Women's Caucus, who has a long history of actually amazing accomplishments for women and women's health. We're so happy to have this opportunity and your time. I'm a psychologist, so I do speak one-on-one, and I hear those one-on-one stories, and I'm a researcher. So I survey, along with my colleagues, sometimes 500,000 people, and it's amazing how these these data points align and we need to hear from the one person because it really can move us as humans as to how people can be affected and we need to know from the hundreds of thousands or the millions what kind of impact we're working with so that we can move forward for women living with these chronic illnesses. I want to speak real briefly in my time about what life has been like during the pandemic not only the challenges, but opportunities, and what we can do to move forward in a positive way following the pandemic and keep the positive waves going forward. So migraine and ME-CFS share several things. They're both invisible illnesses. Everyone looks great, everyone looks fine, you look fine. Uh, One of the most frustrating things that people living with these illnesses can hear, they can both be terribly disabling, These diseases affect more than the person with the disease. They affect partners, they affect children, parents, employers, coworkers, friends. They affect our communities and our families, our teams and organizations, employers. They affect our entire American culture. And that's why it's so important to think about how can we support women living with these chronic illnesses. We have a pandemic with a virus which actually uh, enhances both symptoms of migraine and headache and fatigue. And as it was so eloquently pointed out, ME-CSF may be a component of post-COVID-19 long COVID syndrome. We may be seeing what numbers of new people joining this patient community of this underfunded, undertreated, underdiagnosed, under-researched disease that currently has no FDA approved treatments. Um, In addition, several migraine comorbidities are risk factors for COVID-19 catching the disease, and to put it bluntly, are risk factors for death or morbidity. Um, In addition, people of color, as Ashanti read out those important statistics, are much higher risk of not only contracting COVID-19, as well as dying from it. Again, I'm being blunt. I could say morbidity and mortality. No, let's talk about death. These are real people. My hospital's in the Bronx. 4,000 people in my hospital's neighborhood have died already in months from this disease. And it's disproportionately people of color and people with comorbidities such as these two diseases we're talking about. Indirect effects. So, you know, we have a terrible number of people who've had COVID-19. And whether you've had it or not, everyone in the country and around the world is living together with all of these ripples that come from this pandemic. Lifelines during the pandemic, what has been good? Telehealth. Now, Jamie talked about already having some limited telehealth 
and as we heard earlier, every state is a little bit different. One thing that's been good is that during this crisis, um, our, our government came together to lift some of our current limitations and telehealth, whether it's web, phone or other, or mobile health applications have been incredibly well received. Um, uh, these are folks who a lot of times um, even pre-pandemic would have a hard time getting to an appointment, getting dressed and up and out when they feel terrible. Um, and this really lifts the burden so that people can get the mental and the psychological or uh, physical and the mental health care they need. So telehealth has been a real positive thing during this pandemic. Um, in addition to insurers that did temporarily lift some of the usual restrictions, that's been helpful. For people who are working and who have jobs that you can work remotely, work or school from home has actually eliminated some of the more rigid time expectations. People have talked about getting more sleep in the morning, not having to get up quite so early to get dressed and get their kids to school, and that's a good thing for people with migraine or ME-CFS. Um, so that flexibility has been good. And the virtual support advocacy and education that's happened has just been beautiful. Um, in the migraine community, um, patient advocacy groups have created wonderful online um, education and support, Miles for Migraine and the Coalition for Headache and Migraine Patients, the American Migraine Foundation and, and National Headache Foundation have done wonderful online programs, all sorts of creative connections. So I like that in the midst of this dark storm, there have been some silver linings of coping that is working and helpful. And how can we continue this into the future? How can we support this large population living with migraine and or ME-CFS? Well, we can support continued flexibility in medical care. Several people this morning mentioned the House Telehealth Caucus Bill. So our lessons what were our challenges? What are our opportunities? Well, both of these diseases disproportionate, disproportionately affect women, especially in midlife. This is the time when we expect so much of women, when women give so much to society, a time of productivity, responsibilities, and caregiving. The pandemic placed an even greater burden on these challenges, especially for women living with these diseases, as well as women of color, and created barriers to medical care. But telehealth, and other types of flexibility are very helpful. And it would benefit this large segment of our US population to carry these solutions into the future. So just to end on the note before we go to our Q&A that we all know women are essential in our society. Well, I, I certainly hope that all of our collective voices together can remind uh, those who make the decisions about NIH funding the importance of continuing or starting to, to do more funding into the causes and the effective treatments and outcomes for people living with migraine and ME-CFS. For people living with either of these illnesses or any other chronic illnesses for now, the more that you can isolate, the better when you can't follow health practices. And um, the scientists are working as fast as they can. And we're seeing some promising uh, drug trials uh, as far as treatments. So everyone stay hopeful. We're in this boat together uh, for a bit longer, um, but stay hopeful and we'll come out the other side together. We organize and work together. We amplify each other's voices. We talk as we are right now to, to women and men of power who are able to make those decisions. And we can follow the advice of some other diseases which were originally very highly stigmatized and now have treatments such as HIV or breast cancer, diseases where communities got together in mass and said, we are going to raise funds, we're going to demand research, we're going to demand care, and together our voices have so much power. Jamie and Ashanti's voices in singular are so powerful, and when you amplify those by millions of people, and when we have the partnership of the Women's Caucus and American citizens, we can move things forward. We have brilliant scientists, we have passionate patient advocates, and we have dedicated healthcare professionals. We just need to work together and move forward.